Good morning. I hope that uh, all of you that are broadcasting today uh, were not able to meet in church, but we're going to have uh, a church on Facebook. As don't know how long this is going to go on, but I'm thankful that you are listening and tuning in. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to make a comment about the uh, coronavirus. Um, it's unprecedented in what I've never seen in my life of what all's going on in the world today. People's not able to go to work. Um, there's food shortages. People can't buy food. It's really a problem. But I want you to think about one thing. When Jesus returns and takes his church or his believers out of this world, and I mean there will literally be millions taking it one time, it's going to be far greater than any coronavirus epidemic that we've ever seen. And I don't know how people are going to deal with that, but it's going to be a very rough time when that happens. And I want to uh, bring the message today more or less based on this. In 1 Corinthians 15, and starting in verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, and by man also came the resurrection of the dead. First of all, Christ is the first fruits to be risen. Now you say, well, what about Lazarus and some of the others that had died? And uh, Jesus, you know, wrote, uh, raised them from the dead. But the point is, they are going to have to die death again. Uh, Jesus died once and for all, and he's the first fruits of uh, them that are that have slept. And it says that by man came uh, death, and that was through Adam, because they disobeyed God, and they ate of the un, uh, pr uh, fruit that was forbidden unto them. And it also by man came the resurrection. And you say, well, Christ, isn't he the, the one that raises the dead? Yes, but you've got to understand something. He, Jesus is referred to as Son of God, and that's those that believe upon him. And he also says he's the Son of Man. And when he talks about Son of Man, he's talking to people that don't see him as the Christ. And he was part man because he was born of an earthly woman who was his mother, Mary. So he is son of God. He is son of man. But we have to realize in order to go to heaven, uh, we have to look at him that he is the son of God, not just the son of man. <clears throat> it says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. And who are those that are Christ? Those that have believed upon him, that have asked for forgiveness of their sins and had accepted the fact that we are sinners. None of us are going to go to heaven if we don't ask Christ to come into our life and believe upon him. Then cometh the end. When he shall deliver up the kingdom of God, even to the Father. There's something that I want us to stop here a little bit and, and think about. <clears throat> the gift that God gave to the world was his son. That's his gift. The gift that the son is going to give to the father is all of the believers. And someday he's going to give the gift of all the believers to the Father. And we have to understand this too. <laughs> there are people in the world today that don't know Christ as their Savior and they're not going to be a part of Christ's gift to the Father. He says, <clears throat> also here, I have a footnote here, <clears throat> that there is a uh, the sin was brought about by Adam and salvation is brought about by Christ Jesus. There are two resurrections going to be in the end of time. 
the resurrection and the judgment seat will be the first for the believers is of called the mercy seat because he has mercy on us because we believed upon him. But there's also going to be a white throne judgment and that's the one he judges that have not believed upon him. It's sure better to be at the judgment of the mercy seat than it is to be at the white throne judgment. If you will turn with me over in uh, Corinthians, still in 15, 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to start in 51. Behold, I show you a mercy, a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but shall be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trump, for the uh, trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise incorruptible, and shall be changed. For this corrupt must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And uh, I read this verse last Sunday, and I want us to really concentrate on what he's telling us here. We live in a corrupt world. Our bodies are corrupt. And this corrupt person that I am will have to put on incorruption and immortality. I'm mortal. I'm going to die. But I'm going to receive a body hereafter that will be immortal. I will not die any longer, anymore, once I've died and gone to heaven. So when this corrupt shall have put on incorruption... And this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. We all that are here on this earth will experience the death, a physical death, but for those that do not know Christ as their Savior, will experience what is known as the second death, and that's a spiritual death. And we'll get into that a little deeper on into the message today. He says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is in the law. God gave us certain laws to follow in the Old Testament, but man cannot keep God's laws. This is one reason he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be a bearer of our sins because we just simply cannot keep God's laws. We cannot. And Jesus was sinless. He was perfect. He had no sin in him whatsoever. So he died. He become a scapegoat, if you will, for us to forgive us of our sins. But he says, Thanks be unto God, which give us us the victory for, uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory in Jesus Christ. And if you will now, go with me over into Matthew chapter 16. And I'm going to read you just a few things here that uh, we touch in on about how we must see God as Christ. Matthew 16, and we're going to start in 13. And when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do the men uh, say that the Son of Man am? You see, he didn't say here he's Son of God. He mentions himself as being Son of Man. He's saying, Who do the people say that I am? The Son of Man. And this is Peter's reply to him. And they say, some say that thou art John the Baptist, which he had already been deceased by having his head cut off. Some say Elisus. Some say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. That's how the world perceives him and looking at him as being a son of man. Then Jesus made it very personal to Peter, and he said unto him, but whom do ye say that I am? He made it personal. Who do the people say I am? Now he's saying, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
He's saying, you're the son of God. And that's what every believer must have in his heart, to see him as son of God more than just being son of man. And Jesus answered unto him and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjana, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Flesh and blood that we're in in this body is going to put on immortality. It's not going to be corrupt. The body that we have in heaven is a body that we will recognize one another and it'll be a body that'll last forever, but it's not going to be flesh and blood like we are today. No hurt, no pain, no sorrow. The body that we have in heaven will be everlasting. Mm -hmm. If you will, turn with me over into Ephesians, uh, 1 Thessalonians, excuse me, yeah, Thessalonians. In chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 14. <clears throat> For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. When Jesus decides to come, or God the Father sends Jesus to raise up the dead in Christ, nothing can, no one can stop it. It's not going to be hindered in any way. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. <clears throat> the dead in Christ that have already been buried, they're going to rise first. And then it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up into, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Not for a little time, not for a year, not for a decade, but we will be with him forever. And he says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. And if you're a child of God, you do find this comforting mm -hmm. to know that you'll spend eternity with God. <clears throat> If you will now turn with me in Revelations in chapter 20. And we're going to start in verse 11. <clears throat> and I saw a great white throne. Now this is what we were talking about earlier. The dead in Christ that is, that is raised, the second resurrection are going to be judged by God and this is before God in the white throne judgment more severe than anything they could ever possibly dream of and he says and I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them not in heaven no place for them in heaven and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which... Now there are two books here he mentioned. One is... Uh, one book was open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And if you know Christ is your Savior, you're written in the Lamb's book of life. But the sec this second book is your name isn't in the book of life. It's a sad thing. <laughs> he said, and there were written in the books according to their works. Now, some people believe that you go to heaven by your works. You don't. You simply get to heaven 
by Christ Jesus and him alone. But I will take it this far. Some people that have worked to serve God more than others. So their reward in heaven will be more. You're not saved by your works, but your rewards in heaven will be how hard you worked for God. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way for those that die and go to hell. And Adolf Hitler, for instance, ooh, he's really going <laughs> to be tormented in hell for all that he did while he was alive. And so he's going to judge those that are not saved, some in hell uh, judged according to their works, some will be tormented more severely than others. Say a person died and he never killed anybody, he was a pretty good person, but he just never believed in Christ. He's going to suffer for not accepting Christ, but he sure won't suffer near like what Adolf Hitler will. So we're judged by our works, by our deeds, to get rewards in heaven, and by what degree of suffering you will do in hell. And he says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. There again, he brings it out, that they are judged by their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. We mentioned that earlier. The second death for those that non-believe are going to hell. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now I said all this, and this is about where I was planning on ending my sermon, but I heard a preacher the other day, he said that when you go to hell, because you didn't believe in Jesus, fire consumes everything, and that after a while, you would only become ashes, and there wouldn't be any more suffering for you. And I totally disagree with that. And I've got a few verses here I want to bring out. Uh, to make you understand a little more that this preacher that said this on TV, he's definitely wrong. If you will, look with me in Thess 2 Thessalonians. In chapter 1, And we're going to start in verse 6 through 10. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So anybody that's a sinner and they've mistreated you and they've not believed in Christ, you know, God loves his children. And he says, Suffer not the little children to come unto me, for this is how the kingdom of God is made a childlike faith. And he says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in a flaming fire take vengeance upon them that know not God, and they obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not God's will that any man should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But sadly, not everyone has turned to God. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? What part of everlasting does this preacher not understand? who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because their testimony among you was believed in that day. But I wanted to bring that out because he brought it out that there would be everlasting destruction. 
I got one more verse I want to read to you, and that's found over here in Mark chapter 9, and it's verse 42 through 44. And he says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone was hanged about his neck and cast into the sea. And if the hand offend thee, cut it off, for it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands and going into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Oh, that don't sound to me like you're gonna burn up and become ashes after a short time. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched how much plainer can we understand that if you do not know Christ as your personal Savior and you've not invited him to come into your heart and believe upon him there is a hell hell is a reality heaven is a reality and it's up to you to, to decide where you would like to spend eternity. And I ask you from the bottom of my heart, if you do not know Christ as your personal Savior, ask Him to come into your life today. I don't want to see anybody go to hell. It is a far, far great burning that never, ever ceases. And it's everlasting. God bless you. May you have a great week. In Jesus' name, we want to pray for you. There's a lot going on in the world today. And I am praying that pretty soon we can all start going back to our church and serving the Lord in the way that we're accustomed to. God bless you. We love you. Thank you.